Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. Today's episode is number 45, and we have a special guest today, Creative Director Chris Fitch. Just a reminder, today's episode is brought to you by Inventables, a new CNC solution for your business. Make bigger projects faster with the XCarve Pro. You can see it in action at xcarvepro.com. All right, so... Today, John Doyle has graciously bowed out so we could make some room for our very own Chris Fitch. Did he graciously bow out or did he like skip out of the studio like, heck yeah, no podcast today. Right. I think you can hear the tires are still screeching (laughs) way out. Well, Chris, uh, do you mind just giving a little short bio about who you are and what you do? Who I am. Well, um, all right. I'm the creative director here at Wood Smith. I've been here for 20 years, 20 long, 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 long years. And what I do here is I try and come up with some great projects that people will enjoy, that they'll like, that will test their skills a little bit. And that's been a lot of fun over the years. So we've made a lot of machines, a lot of tools, a lot of nice pieces of furniture. And it's been a, been a great time. Cool. Now, one of the reasons that we that I wanted to have you on here is uh, a little, I don't know, underhanded, devious, is that we offer uh, a monthly uh, online seminars just as a way to extend the opportunities that we have for teaching and learning for Woodsmith. And you have a class coming up in December on designing for the CNC. Do you want to... Yes, that's going to be a lot of fun. You know, CNC machines have been on the market, the hobby woodworking market, for a couple of years now. But I think the prices are coming down. The accessibility is up. People are really understanding that these are exciting machines that have a lot of potential that you can do a lot with. So our seminar, the seminar coming up in December, is, of course, designing for a CNC. And really what that's going to be about is how do you integrate that machine into your workflow in the shop? What makes sense? Uh, I would never build a project exclusively on a table saw, so we're not going to try and do that. Ex- say that you should do things exclusively with a CNC. It's one more tool and a fantastic tool with a lot of potential. So we're going to try and explore a little bit of that. Okay. Well, and it's funny. I think it's it's interesting because, and this is I'm sure we're going to get a comment about this. Um, Chris, how? with you being kind of the the Tony Stark of the Woodsmith shop like in that room with all these different <laughs> robots running what do what do you say to somebody that says you know hey cnc is not woodworking i mean because that's something i hear all the time and i actually i just saw on facebook like this morning somebody was talking about um cnc and saying you know seriously guys this isn't woodworking yeah. how do you respond to that cuz i know my response uh, how do you respond to it? Well, you know, I think the woodworking tent is awfully big, and I don't think we need to be exclusive about any one part of it. Uh, I admire, respect, enjoy wood turning, marquetry, wood carving, uh, reproduction furniture work, hand tool work. I'm also okay with power tools in the shop, and I'm okay with the CNC. What I really found is the CNC lets me do more things better it's not exclusive in any way and i think to to make it a uh, a gateway or a barrier let's say a barrier is, is just the wrong attitude to have towards it with the cnc i can mill metal now i can mill plastic i never could before i can take a little drudgery out of some jobs that i don't really want to do for instance like scroll sawing lettering for signs i'd rather have the machine do that any old day so is it is it degrading my work? No. If I want to do a project that's all hand tools with hand cut joinery, well, I do that and the machine stays in its corner. But for a lot of things, that versatility, that ability to do things I couldn't before is just invaluable. So it's not about limiting your shop, it's about expanding it. Okay, okay. fair enough. I say most most of the time my responses get your head out of your beep, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or get your get the stick out of your beep. Yeah, I agree <laughs> no, with that. Because I mean, seriously, if you think about it, you know, 
most of the time the people making those comments are people that are sitting there in their shop with, uh, you know, fully decked out, not necessarily fully decked out shop, but they're sitting there with their drill press or a table saw mm -hmm. or a jointer or a planer. Same thing would have been said 150 years ago when the, the hand tool guy looked at that newfangled table saw and mm -hmm. said, that's not really woodworking because you're just pushing the wood through the blade. Right. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I foresee those comments coming. Uh, those comments do pop up, um, but I think you're right. I think it's like, you know, for, for knocking out, um, you know, lettering for a sign or I'm looking at my, uh, across the, the shop of me or where I'm at in my shop is a, a big shield hanging on the wall that I made in high school. Uh, and I routed um, my family coat of arms on mm -hmm. the shield with the CNC. I'm not going to do that freehand with a router. I mean, could I? Yeah, probably, but I don't want to. <laughs> so, you know, it's just one of those things. It's another tool. And I, I like, I like what you said, where you say, you know what, if I want to do a project with all hand tools, great. The machine's quiet in the corner. If it's not in the quiet in the corner and you're not doing it, then something's wrong with the machine. You should probably look at it, <laughs> but you know, it's up to you to, to use it if you want to. Absolutely. No, I think it's too easy in woodworking or in, in any hobby or any job for these these barriers to come up and, you know, people want to be exclusive. You're not a woodworker if you don't know all your Stanley planes, that kind of thing. That's silly. It's a hobby. Yeah. We're, we're here to have fun and enjoy and learn. Yeah, and I think what's interesting, because uh, you... You and one of the other, there was another editor here a number of years ago, Randy Maxey, mm -hmm. kind of got into CNCs before the end of Shop Notes. And we got a shop bot in, and then you started working on what became the project that we showed in Woodsmith. Mm -hmm. And I think the um, there's an idea that with a CNC, all you do is walk up to it, push the big green button, and then it just poops out a project when you're done but there is a there is a skill level and a learning curve to using it just like there is with any tool right oh absolutely you know on the you, one you have to you have to design your part and you have to create files which the machine can actually run on and so uh, that's no different than making a sketch up drawing of a piece of furniture which is accepted uh, it's no different than a pencil sketch. You have to make decisions about what you're doing. And then you have to make decisions for how the tool's gonna operate. Uh, it is not push button woodworking at all. I'll guarantee you, you can make colossal mistakes with a CNC just as well as any other machine. At least I've told so that. It's, it's interesting. So when, I obviously wasn't here when shop notes ended mm -hmm. uh what year was that because i mean my my high school shop i'm gonna show myself you know chris has been at woodsman for 20 years uh, i haven't been out of high school for 20 years so my uh my high school had a cnc mm -hmm. when i was there my junior and senior year which have been 2006 2007 um it was a larger in I don't want to say a larger industrial because it was a four mm -hmm. by four format. So it wasn't huge, mm -hmm. but at that time, most of the CNC's available were quote industrial. They were right. geared mm -hmm. towards industry. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, have you noticed a, a difference, I guess, in the ease of use of a, you know, quote industrial type machine um, versus some of these home uh, home shop models? Are they, have they gotten easier to use in your opinion? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think the, uh, the software is so much friendlier now and they're so much more accessible. Uh, as an example, the, we have a, uh, next wave automation shark in our, in our shop now, and it has a pendant where instead of having to be linked to the computer, you can just bring a flash drive, plug it in and access what you need to. Oh. And so that's super simple, uh, to the, the software, let's say, um, in order to design something, you can either do that in two, two dimensions or three. Most of the software for hobbyists like Vectric have a nice, simple uh, 2D drawing program in them. And so it's pretty easy to go ahead and create things. And you can always import. The importing option is awesome. There are plenty of companies that sell ready to go plans. 
So if you want a, a simple gift item, a model, you name it, it's out there and you can bring it in. And then it's just a matter of setting up the, uh, the different bit sizes, speeds, and so forth, and you're good to go. So you don't have to start from absolute scratch. You don't have to master highly complicated programs. There's resources out there. And things are really coming together now with these, these accessible programs, all the pre-made, pre-designed projects that you can do to help you get started, and then machines that are low cost and easy to use. So it's all coming together. Sure. Now, I, I remember that when I was in high school, we were, we were drawing stuff in AutoCAD mm -hmm. is what we were drawing stuff in. Uh, some, I, I would assume that most people have some familiarity with uh, some form of software program, right? So whether it's Illustrator um, or SketchUp, uh, mm -hmm. is the ability there uh, in your experience to um, import files from those programs to where, you know, the, the, the software that drives the CNC is robust enough that it can take a file format saved from say illustrator or saved from SketchUp or mm -hmm. saved from an open source type software. Cause I know that's when I've looked at CNCs in the past, you know, you, you have a, a fair investment to, to purchase the CNC, mm -hmm. even though they are becoming uh, more accessible, but then you also have a software investment. Um, but now some of these drawing softwares are open source, meaning they're, they're kind of uh, crowd built, meaning mm -hmm. they're free. Um, is that, is that ability there in your experience? You know, I don't have a lot of experience with all of the software that's on the market. A lot of machines come with a, so a well, there's CAD software in which you mm -hmm. create your project and there's CAM software, which actually creates the G code, the instruction sheet for the machine. And finally, there's an operating system. When you purchase a machine, it will come with the operating system. That's proprietary, is your proprietary. A lot of companies are selling their CNC machines with Vectric software. That's very common for hobbyists. And it's a very, it's a simplified, easy to use software, which sort of walks you through the various steps of preparing for the creation of the G code. As far as the uh, drawing software itself, uh, you mentioned SketchUp. SketchUp's output is not compatible with uh, CNC machines. Sure. But there are plenty of other choices. It just has to have a vector output. So uh, things like Corel, simple drawing programs that may come yeah. with your computer package uh, will work fine for that. Uh, Vectric itself has a simple drawing program in it. Uh, I regularly use uh, Autodesk Inventor, which we use here, of course, at work to create illustrations in all of our projects. Uh, it exports in uh, DXF files or the sure. AutoCAD drawing package. And that seems to be widely accepted by any of the yeah. uh, various programs. But there are some inexpensive, uh, one option I've looked at recently to get us to, uh, to start learning on, and uh, it's a company called Alibri, and it's uh, they have two options. One is a 3D program called Atom, and it's meant for hobbyists. I used, I used to own an older version of that program called 3D Magic, and it works a lot like our Autodesk Inventor in that you create parts, you extrude the parts, and then you build, can bring them into a separate file and start assembling them with constraints. So you can do very complicated projects with that, and then you have the ability to export out in a variety of file types, which your CAM program would then accept. So it's, uh, it's low cost. They have a higher cost program that has the CAM feature built into it for the G-code output. But I, I guess what I would say is no one should be intimidated by software anymore. There's so many options. And if you choose the right options, they're, they're very friendly towards hobbyists. So if you can open your email, search on the web, you probably have the ability to, to learn. And it takes a little time, sure, but you can learn what you need to. And what I've, what I've been telling people is don't be intimidated by the software because you only need to learn what you need to create the project you're doing. You don't need to worry about the rest of it. That'll come in time. Sure. sure. I guess what I like about it too is, you know, and it's maybe part of it is the age that we live in. And we've brought this up in other episodes, Logan, with your sawmill is, I mean, you can get in as involved as you want to. 
you know, that if you wanted to do, you know, have a CNC create templates or patterns for your projects, but don't have a CNC, all you have to is, all you need is the ability to draw those and connect with someone who does, whether it's a company or, you know, somebody in your woodworking club or just in your, you know, sphere of influence that you can mm -hmm. find. That's absolutely right. So, yeah, you don't have to be limited. You don't have to make an investment in the machine and learn everything there is to do to know about it. And you can still access the power of a CNC. Yeah, you know, it's 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 kind of cool. I've I found the same thing with 3D printers, mm -hmm. too. You know, I've uh, in a past life, I've, I managed a print shop. We had a lot of antiquated machinery that we were kind of modifying to become, you know, 21st century machinery. Mm -hmm. And there was many, many times where I needed, I needed to test something. So it's like, oh, hey, I need to hold an optic eye here to see a sheet of paper for some, you know, weird reason. And instead of paying my machine shop to machine a part, I drew it in SolidWorks mm -hmm. and then uh, did a quick Google search. And there's, there's directories that you could find online of uh, local CNC shops, local 3D printers, and you can send them the file and l like literally send the file on a Wednesday afternoon and Thursday afternoon, the guy sends me an email says, hey, it's it's done. It's sitting on my front porch in a box swing by whenever you want to pick it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, oh, that's so cool, you know? Yeah, and I, I found the same thing for, for metal work. There are a variety of shops which are basically e-machine shops. And if you send them the file, They'll do an automatic quote for you online, and yeah. they've got every known process from uh, from powder coating to uh, you name it. And you can have any material made. There's also places that will 3D print metal. Uh, yeah. So if you've got the ability to create the part virtually, you can have it made. Today's episode, just as a reminder, is brought to you by Inventables. Now, in addition to a bunch of the CNC gear and equipment and know-how that Inventables offers, they have a couple of CNC solutions, and there's a new one coming out, uh, a larger format CNC machine that they're calling the X-Carve Pro. So you can uh, take a look at their website for all their other solutions at inventables.com or look dedicated at their site for the CNC at xcarvepro.com. So you were the one, Chris, that designed and built the first in our project for the shop built CNC, which mm -hmm. has actually been remarkably popular with a lot of mm -hmm. people. We've had quite a few people download those plans. And even when they came out in the magazine that we, you know, people were starting to build them as soon as it came out. Uh, could you share a little bit about some of your goals maybe in designing that and where, where you wanted that machine to end up? When I started designing that, which was probably close to four years ago now, there really weren't that many options available for CNC machines. There were some coming out on the market, some being advertised. I guess what I was really after was sort of the, uh, I say this with a small d, the democratic CNC machine, something that was buildable and accessible to everyone. And... I started doing a, few, a lot of research and I found a couple of books that were out there and they were for machines that were relatively unsophisticated, but had the basic concepts down. So what I was after was creating something which was incredibly simple, uh, as inexpensive as I could make it, that had a capacity that was greater than a lot of the desktop machines that were out there and that could be built with the capability of the shop notes slash woodsmith reader. So it was geared towards woodworkers. And it was uh, really an interesting process of, uh, of learning at that time. There were maybe two places that I found on the web which were offering all the various parts that were needed, the different uh, stepper motors, the uh, anti-backlash nuts. And I ended up with one down in, in, in the Houston area called Build Your CNC as a source. There were a lot of good videos and things uh, with that company. And so little by little with the books and just purchasing uh, products and trial and error, 
I came up with, I, with what I thought was a, a machine that just sort of made sense, that would have longevity, that would be very rugged, you could make mistakes with it, and two, something that could be modified extensively. You know, with the Woodsman CNC machine, it's a two by four format now, but you could easily extend that to almost eight feet. Probably can't go wider than two, but you could easily make it longer. Uh, you could give it more capacity or less. You could tighten things up for a little more rigidity. You can add uh, limit switches, add a lot of different things. It was meant to be a starting point for people who are interested and wanted to learn. And I think it is serving that purpose. I've got some great feedback over the last uh, over the last two years of people who've made it, and I can see the foundation there. But but you know they've done their own thing, and I think that's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's interesting is that whenever it, CNC aside, when you design and build a project from scratch, you always get the project done, and you're like, ah, you know what? If I ever had to build another one, here's the things I would change, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Now you have built two of these, and you have ran them extensively mm -hmm. in the shop. What would you change on the on the Woodsmith design? Is there anything you would change on the Woodsmith design that you designed? Hmm. Yeah, I'll tell you what it is. Uh, these are silly things, but but they're real. Okay. Right now, I've got the electronics enclosure on top of the surface of the machine. And I did that because in order to create a stable gantry, I made it wide, and that created a certain dead space where nothing else could go. And so, well, why not put the electronics there? And two, sure. being a magazine, I wanted everything to be encompassed in one three-quarter photograph, which it does. Well, I'm just telling you from experience, if you set your coffee cup on top of the machine and run the gantry back, it will crush it against the electronics exposure and create a mess. <laughs> if you set your coffee cup on top of the electronics closure, it will sweep it off onto the floor and it will right. not survive. Okay, there you go. Another thing so, is- So yeah, cup holder? I, I, I just hear a cup holder, that's all I hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would make it very current, you're right. But should it be on the gantry or should it be on the side? Maybe it'd be more fun if it traveled with the gantry. Yeah, oh, there you go. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. I like that, I like that. Okay, good upgrade, good upgrade. Yeah. Uh, the other trouble I've had it is that sometimes I'll, um, I like to use a spoil board and screw everything down securely. And of course I'm using a cordless drill. There's just enough room under the machine to throw that cordless drill. But unfortunately, when the gantry comes along, it hits that drill and that can cause some grief too. So that's, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's operator beware. I should be smarter than that, but I'm not. I've proven that <laughs> twice now. So I think I might raise the legs up a little bit for clearance or put some guard skirts. Two two bolt on accessories, a cup holder and a <laughs> drill holder. Drill, yeah, drill, drill holder. Right, there you yeah. go. I like cup that. Holder. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. No, I think those are the two main things. You know, I've thought about. You know, I'm currently rebuilding the original prototype, mm -hmm. and the reason was I thought I would like to make it just a little bit more rigid, and so I'm actually increasing the size, or rather, the, I'm increasing the distance between the bearings on the parts of the gantry. The main gantry remains the same, but the y-axis and the z, I'm increasing the, the footprint a little bit of the bearings. That's going to reduce the width a little bit, so it's going to be a 18-inch by 48-inch machine. But I'm doing that just to make it a little more solid because I'm finding I enjoy the metalwork greatly, and that requires rigidity. But that's part of the nice thing about the machine. I built it. I know what to do. I'm rebuilding it to make it a little bit different. Sure. And it'll have a cup holder and the <laughs> exactly. caddy for the drill. <laughs> so when you're, when you're talking metalworking, just, I mean, and Phil and I have seen what you've been doing in, in the shop, but obviously our listeners have not. Are you talking aluminum? Are you talking brass? Are you talking steel? What, what type of metals are you cutting on it? Okay, for CNC machines, we really want to stick with non-ferrous metals. And so that's going to be brass and it's going to be aluminum. Uh, aluminum is inexpensive, it's versatile. Mostly what I've been working with is 60, 61, which is a very common form. Uh, mm -hmm. Brass, you probably want to go with the free cutting brass. Uh, tell me, I'm forgetting, the, I'm forgetting the alloy number. It's uh, uh, 360? Yeah, correct. Yeah. And so that's free cutting brass, which is uh, very easy to work with. And 
I think it's just amazing that this woodworking machine can also cut metal and can also cut plastic. So the metalworking has been a lot of fun because I found that I can make tools, I can make replacement parts, I can do all sorts of things with it. And so that kind of gets back to this idea of a CNC machine is going to expand your shop. It expands what you can do. It doesn't limit you, it expands you. So the metalwork is fun. It uh, requires unique bits. It requires some lubrication with those bits. It requires certain speeds, certain feeds, a little know-how, but it's not that hard to do. And sure. well worth learning. Yeah. Could you do copper, you think? Oh, absolutely, sure. Okay. Yeah. I say I, I just watched a uh, uh, so on Sunday. I, I've done a couple of these. I watched mm -hmm. a seminar on Sunday, uh, kind of like we do, mm -hmm. um, but it was done by a, a gentleman out of Ireland uh, by the name of Pat Carroll. He's a Turner, mm -hmm. uh -huh. and this one on last Sunday was uh, it was basically uh, adding pewter casting to your turning so, oh, so like doing a, a pewter rim or a pewter finial and stuff so i was like oh that'd be kind of cool you could do a cast pewter mm -hmm. rim and see and see it and that'd be kind of cool yeah well one thing i'm thinking we have this as we've mentioned earlier i have this seminar coming up and i want to show ways that you can incorporate the cnc into your into your projects and one thing i've always liked about arts and crafts furniture is the sometimes you'll see copper inlays mm -hmm. or, or, or or mother of pearl inlays and so I know we had a, a project in Woodsmith a few years back, which were some little arts and crafts boxes. And I remember I got some, uh, I think it was a little less, maybe maybe a, maybe five, uh, five hundredths of a thick copper. And I had cut uh, oak leaves and ginkgo leaves in different patterns and then actually routed out the recess to plop them in. And so I thought I would pull those computer files out and have the CNC machine cut those copper parts for me and cut the inlay yeah. that's sort of a fun fun you know show and tell of uh of something you could do yeah so yeah i think copper is a, a really cool metal i mean all the different effects and uh, patinas yeah. you can you can do with it so i think sort you know inlay work and then for turners you bet use the cnc sure well and here's one thing that i see a lot of and it, it's <laughs> This is funny because this doesn't get the same type of um, uh, polarizing effect that a CNC does in woodworking mm -hmm. shops. Uh, but we're talking when we're talking CNCs. Generally, we're talking CNC routers. Mm -hmm. But I would group a, a laser into that as well, right? I mean, it's all it's all CNC X Y axis. You know, on a laser, you don't have the Z axis, but it's the same thing. Have you um, considered now? I know, I know, kind of some of the things that you have in the works with uh, these classes upcoming. Uh, but have you considered a CNC head for the the Woodsmith one? Because I see a lot of guys, uh, mainly in oh, one of the Facebook groups I'm on is is a cutting board Facebook group. It's guys that just make cutting boards, but they make a lot of them for craft shows and stuff. And a lot of them have these small format, you know, maybe six mm -hmm. by six lasers that they literally just put on top of the cutting board and it will engrave the cutting board. Uh, have you thought about a laser head for the, the Woodsmith version? Absolutely. I'm, I'm kind of pining away for a laser for our, our, our CNC room back there. So uh, plenty of companies have little 40 watt laser add-ons that you can use with your, with your router. Uh, I've been kind of poking around a little bit, looking at laser components they're out there, you can purchase them. And so I think it'd be a heck of a lot of fun if we could concoct a laser head, which would slip into the uh, the Woodsmith CNC router. Uh, I know Builder CNC has all the components. That's something they offer with their machines. And as a sponsor for our upcoming uh, YouTube show, uh, they're giving us a really nice uh, CNC router, but I'm hoping, and they've promised, I that we may get a laser gantry with that. So we'll have the capability of, uh, of laser work on a large scale. So I think it'd be totally cool to have a laser. I mean, who, who wouldn't have fun with a laser? Uh, I want to do that. Yeah, I'm getting yeah, excited you know, here, I'm getting excited. But uh, yeah, a, a 40 watt laser for engraving, and then eventually it'd be nice to have something more in the lines of an 80 or 100 watts so we could actually do some cutting. Because the laser has the yeah. advantage uh, it has no, there's no kerf. There's no kerf as with a router bit, and you can make precise 90 degree corners that you can't really do with a router bit. 
Yeah, you know, and it's it's when you're saying forty watt, you're generally talking about like a CO two laser, correct? Yes, they're all CO two lasers. Yep, yep, uh, and I think there are. Uh, and I could be wrong, but I think there are little LED lasers that are like five or 10 watt, mm -hmm. uh, maybe up to 15 watt that are basically just a little cartridge um, that are generally for like engraving plastic or something mm -hmm. that doesn't require that much uh, wattage. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you start talking, you know, CO2 lasers, then you're generally talking about a tube and and mirrors to bounce the laser to the head. And then you have focal lengths to set and all that. That's true. Different stuff. So, yeah, I've... I, one of my fun purchases when I was managing the print shop was a small scale laser that we used to engrave some of our products. Mm -hmm. um, so it was it was fun to be able to mess around with that. Uh, but yeah, being able to laser cut out some parts would be really cool too. Well, I've noticed a lot of these laser add-ons these companies are offering are, are very small. And so maybe they're the LED type that you're mentioning. Yeah. And I think that's wonderful, but the tubes would be a lot more fun, wouldn't they? Oh, more power is always more fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're tall. They have to be water-cooled. I mean, it just gets more fun. Yeah. Than it, so. yeah. E exactly. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you start adding water cooling and coolant to a machine, oh, you know it's going to be. <laughs> you can get yourself in a lot of trouble really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe a flashing strobe light as a warning. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But then but then, not only do we have to worry about wearing our masks in the shop, then we have to worry about wearing the uh, the goggles. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Sunglasses in the shop. Well, we're already cool. Right. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we've talked about it a little bit, Chris, but uh, one of your new projects for next year is to offer a CNC show. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, like where – What's your idea there for that show? Okay. Well, what we'd like to do is offer a show that will be monthly, and it'll be a free show on YouTube. And the idea really is to help people who are just getting into the CNC world learn about their machine, learn about what's out there, have a place to connect, have a place to come to. There's a ton of information available on, on YouTube, of course, and on the web, but it's a little jumbled. It's not very organized. I'm really hoping that through the series, we can offer over the course of the year, a lot of really good information. And what I want the information to be is not to, um, well, the information which gets you started, gets you busy, gets you using your CNC, as opposed to learning an awful lot of facts, which may be interesting, but you really don't need it and are going to forget shortly. So it's about getting you engaged in the product, in your CNC. Uh, so we're going to have a lot of good information on it. I'd also like the the show to include some project building so you can really see uh, CNC in use. And we can talk about some of the little ins and outs of it all, like like not putting your coffee cup on the top of the charge uh, <laughs> closure. <laughs> and uh, kind of work you through some things. And hopefully maybe some uh, some simple downloadable plans so that we have projects. And with the idea that watch the show, Download a plan and you are busy using your CNC and learning in your shop. So it's really about hands-on work and hands-on learning. Cool. So that's, we'll do that on YouTube monthly. I'm kind of looking forward to that because I think there's a lot of people that uh, see a CNC and there's, I think most of the information that I've seen, it comes from not to be derogatory, but a little computer nerdy, mm -hmm. you know, and I think what I've really liked about seeing your work in developing our own CNC machine and then using that and some other ones is that you're coming at it from the woodworker, project builder, maker sort of perspective. And yeah. mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah, my angle is I want to have fun with this thing and use it. I'm not really that interested in learning the intricacies of Mach 3 or whatever program that there is. I'm not really a software guy. I, I learn enough and know enough to accomplish what I need to and what I want to, but I'm more interested in, in the output. Yeah, and, I, and that's the other thing that I really appreciate is the enthusiasm of it and then like just what are all these capabilities of doing it and being able to communicate that to to other people because i think you know some people think that it's oh it's just for making giant 
dragonfly models out of thin plywood or, you know, engraving some, you know, corporate logo onto a coaster or something like that. But there's a lot more that's going on. There is. And that's certainly one of the goals of the show is to give people examples of what you can do. And I really hope that the show is going to be interactive. I really like people to show us what they're up to and give us suggestions and communicate. And we can really have a good, a good running conversation about how fun these machines are and what we can do with them. Yeah. Cool. Well, and it's something that we're using, like you said earlier, that, you know, woodworking is a big tent and it's something that we want to expand into. It's not something that Woodsmith is turning into the CNC thing. It's just we want to be able to connect with as many people in the woodworking community as possible mm -hmm. and be able to showcase that in a variety of formats, whether that's on a TV show, on a YouTube show, on the podcast, a little bit in the magazine, all that kind of stuff. So. I was, saying, I, I was just going to say, I think in the past, you know, Woodsmith's kind of been kind of the, the, the traditional woodworking furniture shop, kind of, you know what I mean? Like uh -huh. building, building furniture projects, but there is a lot, there is a lot more to woodworking than what we have traditionally shown in the past. You know, I've been able to do a lot of turning lately uh, yeah. and, you know, we have people that are interested in carving and then CNC is another, another aspect. So it's kind of a fun it's a fun, fun thing to kind of broaden our tent. Well, yeah. it is. I mean, Woodsmith has always been the source for great projects, but you know, we're expanding our tent and we're, uh, it's just an exciting time here at Woodsmith. We're really growing and trying new things, becoming more accomplished at what we do and sharing all of that. Yeah. And I think it's kind of fun to be able to see, you know, like Logan with his turning, you with your CNC work and even in your carving. So it's like two mm -hmm. ends of the world, so to speak. And, you know, Dylan's got a lot of stuff that he's been working on and uh, mm -hmm. Steve Johnson with that uh, reproduction uh, dresser that he's building. So there's a lot that's that's going on. So and being able to showcase that enthusiasm mm -hmm. and find a, a platform for it. So just to wrap things up here, speaking of projects, what do you guys got going on? Well, what I have, is, okay, it's not very exciting, but I've got an old house that constantly needs maintenance, and I'm working on two <laughs> replacement screen doors. Being an old house, they're seven-footers and absolutely not available. So that's been my project lately, and I've kind of had fun. We're, we're going to be having a, um, a mortising machine show up in this next issue of Woodsmith, and I got to use that. It worked great and made a, made a project that I really didn't want to do a lot easier. <laughs> you know it's funny because i have a screen door on my front door that i built uh probably a year ago and uh one of my dogs uh who is no longer with us not for this reason but she went head first through the screen on it uh, i have not it's been like that since the beginning of summer i just have not taken it off and put a new screen in it but it's kind of fun to build build something for the house like that, you know? Oh, it is. It's something you encounter every day, and you can be proud of yeah. what you've done. And uh, the, the heavy-duty animal-proof screen is well worth it. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm going to have to invest in that now. But, yeah. Well, you know, I, uh, I think last week I mentioned I was going to be starting a dining room table for myself. Uh -huh. um, so I did. Uh, I this weekend got my legs cut. So the legs are cut and tapered. I have not mortised them yet. I'm kind of working through the way I'm going to connect the legs to the stretchers. Um, uh, two of the stretchers um, are curved. So the long stretchers, the tabletop is 40, I believe 44 by 90. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty big table, but the, out, the long stretchers are curved. There's about a five inch deflection in the center. Mm -hmm. um, so I was talking to Phil this morning when we were in the studio, you know, like, yeah, well, do I, on these curved stretchers, do I try to cut an integrated tenon on them? And then you got some weird angles there and some curves. And then it's like, ah, do I just mark a, mark a line off my bending form, cut them with a hands on and then just do a floating tenon, which is probably what I'll end up doing. Um, but my, my MDF form is done. It took a full sheet of three quarter inch MDF. So it weighs like 75 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculously heavy. Um, uh, but forms done, legs are done. The next thing is probably going to be to 
uh, start making those laminations. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do, I think, five layers of 3 16th walnut for them. Uh -huh. uh, so they'll be about, uh, I think that ends up being about 15 sixteenths of an inch thick. So uh, we'll do those. I'm going to knock out this base before I even start worrying about the top. Make sure the base mm -hmm. goes together how I want before I start tackling the top. So Sounds cool. Cool. Yeah. I just wrapped up a, a small serving tray that my sister-in-law asked me to make. So she wanted, uh, sent me a photo of something that she found online and I had some leftover, an eight quarter blank of ash that I essentially resawed, you know, off the edges mm -hmm. and then flipped it so I can get that really nice straight grain on it. And then uh, used some of that, it, it's not really stain, it creates a chemical reaction that ages wood to give it oh, that sure. silvery mm -hmm. look to it. So before I did that though, I used a wire wheel and a hand drill and oh, kind of brushed the, the mm -hmm. that straight grain ash to give it a little bit of texture but not make it feel gnarly. And then used that aging solution on there. And it was a, it's pretty cool to see when you first put it on, you're like, oh, dear God, I ruined this thing. <laughs> but then you come back in a couple of hours and it's taken on that silvery gray look that looks just super cool. And then I protected it with a couple of coats of water-based finish and put some handles on it. And I'm kind of kind of excited for how well it turned out. So. Well, good. I feel like we need we need John here to make a joke about the the gnarly aged ash. Right. But something off color that we have to send to each yep. again. So. <laughs> yeah, probably. So. Maybe next week. Maybe. Yeah. He'll be back. All right. I think that wraps it up for another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or smart remarks that you'd like to share, we'd love to hear them. You can send it to us at our email. It's woodsmith at woodsmith.com. Otherwise, if you're not aware, you can watch us perform this podcast on our YouTube channel and leave your questions and comments there. Otherwise, I want to give another special thanks to Inventables who sponsored this episode of the podcast. They're providing a new CNC solution for your business. You can make bigger projects faster with the XCarve Pro. You can check it out in action at xcarvepro.com. Otherwise, we'll see you again next week. Bye, everybody. <laughs>